In this video, we're going to talk a little bit more about two modes of listening, referential and reduced listening, that we introduced already in an earlier video. Because the, coming back to uh, and using the terminology that distinguishes these types of listening is going to be something that we're going to be doing throughout the course. So the slide here is a photo of a man named Pierre Schaeffer, who was a, a French engineer and artist, uh, active from the 30s onwards, um, who is really responsible for this specific terminology, um, referential listening and reduced listening. In the 1940s, Schaeffer conducted a series of artistic experiments using um, sound recording artistically, uh, and uh, he went on to reflect on those experiments um, later in the 1940s and throughout the 1950s uh, and 1960s. And in his reflections on these um, experiments with reproducing sound using audio technologies, he introduced the terminology um, of referential listening um, and uh, reduced listening. Um, and so a few things that we can say about referential listening in particular. You'll remember that referential listening from our other video is listening that um, refers back to the source of the sound. It's listening that doesn't necessarily identify any sound-specific parameters, um, but rather names or labels where the sound came from. So a first um, further observation we can make about referential listening is that for better or for worse, this is a key mechanism of everyday life that we are we're often um, instinctively and habitually doing referential listening as we go about our everyday lives. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. So one of the reasons that referential listening is such a key mechanism uh, is that it has an evolutionary basis that um, identifying the source of sounds is a survival advantage. Um, let's say, in um, an early evolutionary setting. Um, early life forms um, floating around the primordial soup. Um, for these life forms, being able to tell via their early sense of hearing um, whether something that is nearby is something that is going to eat them or is, cons or is conversely something that they can eat, that is something that leads to those life forms um, surviving better and thus um, continuing to reproduce uh, and thus um, evolving into other life forms um, such as us. Uh, and so this evolutionary mechanism is, is, is at work in our everyday life when we listen referentially. And at various points in the course, we will do some experiments where we'll show how good we are at identifying for example, where sounds come from. That's certainly an example of, um, of an evolutionary mechanism in relation to listening. But referential listening is not only evolutionary. It's not only nature. It's also culture. There is definitively also a strong cultural basis for referential listening, particularly in the form that we do it in our everyday lives. We learn particular ways of identifying sources, and we learn in particular the types of labels that we give to sources. There's nothing natural, there's nothing prehistoric, so to speak, about that. Um, and an interesting consequence of this, and we'll have something more to say about this in a second, is that if we learn particular ways of identifying sources, particular ways of labeling sounds, we can also unlearn or relearn or critique the ways that we um, go about that identification. And I think a final further point that we can say about referential listening in connection with the types of things we're doing in this course is that it, it, referential listening underpins the use of sound for narrative representation. And what I mean by that is that we're able to make narratives with sound, even with sound alone, as in the case of a radio play, because people are able to listen to those sounds and they're able to assign them to agents, to actors, to characters in a story. When we hear something, when we hear a character in a radio play, 
and we identify them or we learn to uh, identify those vocal characteristics with that character, we are, we're using our everyday skill of referential listening now in an imaginative process that allows a story to be told. So um, that's a very useful use of referential listening. Um, some recent scholarship has um, productively called attention to, um, let's say, the more problematic aspects of referential listening, the, the ways in which particular ways of um, performing sound and particular ways of hearing sound and identifying it and labeling it um, participate in regimes of racialization. So the scholars Jennifer Lynn Stover um, with her book The Sonic Color Line and Nina Sun Eidsheim with her book The Race of Sound have both called attention uh, in particular to the way that um, black voices are performed and disciplined and labeled in, um, in North American society. And I think later in the course we'll have some side quests that will take us into a little bit of these readings um, for those that want to follow that up in more detail. So we've talked a bit about referential listening. Now let's talk about reduced listening. In, in Pierre Schaeffer's account, reduced listening is sort of like the opposite of referential listening. And um, when um, Schaeffer was first thinking about these things and experimenting with these sounds, um, he had an experience that he would later recount in various ways with um, a sound that was accidentally repeated um, because of a closed groove on a disc. We've got a, it wouldn't have been this kind of disc. We've got an, a long playing record here, and it's a series of um, grooves that go around while a mechanism turns the record and a needle picks up um, the vibration of little um, oscillations in those grooves. Um, and in any, any case, in Schaeffer's disc, which wasn't this kind of disc, um, there was an accidental situation. This is still quite common with records where the record got into a loop because of a defect and the same sound, uh, in some sense exactly the same sound, was repeated again and again and again and again and again. And as this happened, he noticed that his hearing changed. Um, and in another situation, we will do this experiment as well, um, where I will repeat a sound for you. You can do it yourself now if you like. And as you listen to that sound repeatedly, what will happen is that your brain will grow bored with identifying the sound, and it will start to notice qualities of the sound instead we might say that it will start to notice the sound as such instead of the ways that we label it and identify it. Um, so um, suffice it to say that although reduced listening is perhaps not as obviously a part of everyday life as referential listening is, it is nonetheless something that is a part of us and that we do, particularly in certain circumstances such as when sounds are repeated and our brain is forced to lose interest in identifying um, the source of the sound. So um, reduced listening, where we don't identify where the sound came from, but we do attempt to identify qualities of the sound as a sound, really a key challenge of this is terminology. Like, knowing the words for what it is that we're hearing. And so this is something that we can develop throughout the course and throughout our lives, but I want to give a few starting points here. So one really common set of qualities that we might identify in a sound, um, and if we identify these qualities, we're definitely doing reduced listening, is we might think about loudness, which is the, the subjective perception of sounds as loud. Uh, and there's a, a spectrum that goes from loud to quiet. If we use those words, we're definitely talking about sound. We might also think about pitch as a basic way of engaging in reduced listening. Um, if we uh, Pitch is basically the sensation that uh, something can be sung. So if I, if I um, make a tone for you like this, uh, when you hear that tone, you can probably try to match it. 
um, or even if you're not very good at that, um, in theory, you could try to match that tone. And that tone is a pitch. That tone has a pitch. And we can compare the pitch of tones. Like we can listen to this pitch, ah, uh, and this one, ah. Uh, and we can say that the second one is lower than the first one, and the first one is higher. So that's pitch. Um, there is other vocabulary for pitch as well. We can also talk about pitched and unpitched sounds. So the sounds that I've made for you a second ago are all pitched sounds because you could potentially sing them back to me. Um, but we can also think about unpitched sounds like shh, which doesn't have um, that defined pitch um, that we can sing back. There's also tone color as a basic type of reduced listening um, that we can get started with. So if I make a sound like the, 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 one of the A vowels in English, ah, and I compare that with an O vowel, O, oh, we would say that the difference between those two sounds is their tone color. The ah sound is very bright, and the O oh sound is very dark. Um, and we'll see later that this perception of brightness basically has to do with the presence of high frequencies in the sound. Again, more about that later. Um, but we can identify the presence of tone color, or we can identify differences in tone color, um, even without knowing anything about what is causing those differences. So this is, these are things that we can learn to listen for um, uh, in things. And if we, if we do listen for these things, then we're doing reduced listening. Uh, another key um, and helpful category of vocabulary for reduced listening is onomatopoeia. So some of you might remember from um, junior high school or high school English class um, that onomatopoeia is words that um, sound like what they mean. Um, and so these um, onomatopoeic words are often useful um, examples of reduced listening. When we hear something and we say that it's a hiss, we're definitely talking about it as a sound. We're not saying what is doing the hissing. We're talking about the hiss as a sound. So a final point in this video module uh, is to think about why this concept of reduced listening and why paying attention to our ability to do reduced listening might be important. Uh, and we're going to come back here. We're going to conclude um, with another set of vocabulary introduced by Pierre Schaeffer. Schaeffer talked about acousmatic situations and acousmatic listening. Um, acousmatic basically refers to situations in which the source of a sound is invisible. And we could also expand that a little bit to say that acousmatic situations are situations in which the source of a sound uh, is invisible or ambiguous or somehow unclear. The word um, comes from Pythagoras. Um, according to, to legend, Pythagoras would um, lecture to his disciples from behind a screen so they would hear what he was saying, but they would not be able to see him. Um, and uh, Schaeffer and others uh, re resurrected this terminology to refer to situations that seemed to be increasingly common when people were making and listening to audio through loudspeakers. And that basically speaks directly to why it's important to us in this course as well. We're frequently going to be in the situation of recording things, removing them from their original context, transforming them in different ways, and then representing those sounds to an audience, um, perhaps without any visual stimuli, or in any case, without the original visual stimuli. Uh, and so this is basically an acousmatic situation. The original source of the sounds um, has been obscured, and, and now people are going to listen, and they're not going to listen to the original cause of the sound. They're going to listen to the sound as such, and maybe they're going to attempt to assign that to things referentially. Um, maybe not. It's just going to, it's going to kind of depend on the situation. But we know that they're going to be able to hear the loudness of the sounds. We know that they're going to be able to hear the pitch of the sounds. We know that they're going to be able to hear um, the tone color of the sounds and that they're going to notice onomatopoeic effects and all kinds of other types of 
um, reduced listening phenomena as well. Whether or not they can identify where the sound came from, whether or not they can identify what is making the sound, they're going to be able to notice qualities of the sound. Um, and so because this is a situation we're working on and focusing on in this course, the acousmatic situation, um, reduced listening is going to be important for us.